Hi, Grandma here, and I am reading G. Clifton Whistler's Mr. Lincoln's Drummer. And the first thing we do is we look at the cover and we try to make guesses or ask questions. And I have a couple of questions. One is, how old is he? He looks like he's just a child. Another question I have, is this a true story? And then a comment, this must be taking place during the Civil War if it's Mr. Lincoln's drummer. And finally, did he re play for Mr. Lincoln, like a drum solo? I don't understand how Mr. Lincoln had, why he had a drummer. Okay, so those are some questions that I have. And now we're going to open the book and we see some comments here on the first page. A drum is the heartbeat of the army. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? The heartbeat of the army, a drum. I never thought of a drum being that way. And then I open up a few more pages and I see this book is reverently dedicated to all the boys in all the wars who never came back. And I'm a little worried that I'm gonna be interested in this boy and something's going to happen to him. And then I have this page, which is the role of the Vermont, Vermont Voluntary Infantry Regiment, and it names everybody. And now I'm wondering, are any of these going to be appearing in the book? Okay, so now I look on the back cover, and the back cover answers a couple of my questions. A 10-year-old Willie Johnston, so I know he's 10, is too young to be a soldier in Mr. Lincoln's army. So he joins as a drummer boy instead. Part of Willie's job is rousing the trips, troops in the morning with his drum. The other part is being the last to retreat in battles. In this true story, Willie shows he's brave enough to keep beating his drum, but will he be lucky enough to survive the war? So that answered a lot of my questions just by looking at the cover and reading the inside. Now let's begin chapter one. A drum is the heartbeat of an army. Its tempo lets you know whether to hurry along, steady yourself, or take to your heels. It tells you when to get up, eat, and go to bed. And the fellow who taps out the calls is the very heart of every company in every regiment in every armor. They call us drummer boys. Now today, I don't think we have drummer boys, but we have alarms, we have bells, we have whistles, we have other things that uh, try to keep people on beat and on time and regulated. For my part, I came to the war sort of by accident. In April of 61, when the Carolina rebels fired on the flag at Fort Sumter down in Charleston. I was just 10 years old. Except for some bold talk by a few older boys and three long-winded speeches by an abolitionist preacher who had come up from Boston, nobody in town paid much attention to the news that we were at war in the South. It wasn't that we Vermonters weren't patriotic. We had crops to tend and business of our own to mind, though. At least that's what Pa told me. Everything changed the first week of June. Come look at the soldiers, Willie, my little brother Charlie had shouted to me from the street. There's thousands of them. There weren't, of course, but I didn't know that until I'd raced out the door and seen for myself. Tooth Patrol told there were no more than a handful of real soldiers. The rest were tall, skinny farm boys from the neighboring counties. I spied one or two I knew and I waved to them. We've answered Mr. Lincoln's call, Cal Stebbins, a boy up the road, called me. You're not old enough to soldier, Cal, I hollered. I'm 18, he yelled back, and we're taking some even younger. How young, I shouted. Oh, not as young as you, Willie Johnston, Mom cried, grabbing me by the ear. Don't you have work waiting? Yes, ma'am, I confessed as she unclamped my ear. I just thought I'd have a look. Sure, she said, gazing skeptically at me with her tired blue eyes. That's all you hear ever about, looking and asking and idling, <sighs> like some stray pup run off from the farm. 
you're a working boy. Or have you forgotten that again? Oh, I haven't, I insisted. I'm not yet an apprentice though, Ma, and it isn't every day soldiers march down Main Street. In St. Johnsbury, at least. Thank the Lord for that, she grumbled. It's hard enough to keep youngsters at their labors without such foolish distractions. I thought you favored fearing the slaves, Ma, I said, putting on my serious face. Just last Sunday, don't start up now, Willie. William J. Johnston, she warned, I'll, you'll not escape the cutting table so easily. And now I wonder, what is a cutting table? I shook my head and sighed. There was no use arguing with Ma when she went to using my whole name like that. I sneaked a final peek at Cal and the rest of the recruits. Then I stumbled back to the shop and slithered through the door. Now to work, Ma said, pointing to the bolts of fabric stacked on the long wooden table to my left. My older brother, James, sat on the far side of my empty chair, frowning. He was closing in on 14, but I used to think he was born old. Somebody has to be serious around here, he told me once. You manage enough mischief for 10 families, Willie. Once Ma left us to our work, James set aside his shears and stared out the door. Are there very many of them? He asked. Oh, not so many, I replied. Cal Stebbins is with them. A few boys we know from the farms up river. A fair number from Brighton. It sure seems exciting, joining Mr. Lincoln's army and marching south to thrash those rebels, James confessed. It's sure to be over before I'm old enough to go. Cal said they were taking some young ones. I whispered, oh, I heard about that, Willie, but to go, you have to get your parents to sign something. Pa might, I suggested. Ma won't, he insisted. Besides, who would keep the shop going? Who would look after Ma and Charlie? Well, that's Pa's job, I argued. Sure it is, James agreed, but when has he ever done it? I wanted to argue, but it was impossible to talk to James around to your point of view. He never said much, and even then it was after he sat there scratching his ear and chewing the words for a while. Pa dreams, I muttered. He dreams too much, James grumbled. I suppose it was a fault Pa and I shared. Ma thought so anyway. Dreamin' won't get those pages read, she scolded whenever I set my school books down and stared off the, out the window. Dreams don't pay our debts, she would tell Pa. Sure, Pa had his faults, but after all, he hadn't been much older than James when he'd signed on to a ship sailing from Bristol to Boston. Well, I wonder where Bristol is. The future's America, he had told his family. Any English lad with gumption is bound to go there. Well, that kind of tells me that Bristol is in England. It takes a brave young man, much less a boy, to get on a ship to sail from England to America. Whatever else you said about Pa, you had to admit he had gumption. He taught himself to read and write, learned a half dozen trades, and worked his way west to New York by the time I was born. He was running a small shop in Morristown, and Ma told me once they were doing pretty well there. Then Pa got the itch to move on, and we headed east into the green mountains of Vermont. By 1860, we were settled in St. Johnsbury, or St. J, as some called it for short. Pa bought a two-story house in town, and he operated a tailor shop downstairs. He and Ma shared a room at the top of the stairs, and we three boys crowded into a smaller chamber next door, which was intended to be an attic. St. Jay was in Boston, and trade was never all that plentiful. Pa got most of his business altering trousers to fit younger brothers or patching knees and elbows worn out in Sunday suits. Ma did most of the real work, making shirts and dresses of cheap gingham cloth bought off one of the mills down in the Connecticut River. As soon as James and I were old enough, she set us to helping trace patterns and cut cloth when we got home from school. Even Charlie, who was barely five, 
cut scraps into quilting squares. The Keller sisters, a pair of widows, fashioned them into coverlets for the Caledonia County Orphan's Home. I never suspected it that afternoon, but the war brought us more business than I would have imagined. The next day, when James and I clambered downstairs to have our breakfast, a tall, bewhiskered fellow in a fine wool suit stood talking with Pa just inside the door. James, Willie, Pa said, waving us to his side. Shake hands with Colonel Hyde, the new commander of the 3rd Vermont Volunteers. Well, that's a name. I'm wondering if that's one of the names in the front. Colonel Hyde. <gasps> there he is right there in the front of the book. And it says regimental commander. Union regiments originally contained 10 companies of approximately 100 men each. 100 times 10 is 1,000 men he was in charge of. Wow. Okay, let's learn more about Colonel Hyde, who is a, a rare character also, a real person, historical. James offered his hand and the Colonel shook it. I just stared at the man. The Hydes were about as famous a family as there was in the state. The Colonel's grandfather had fought at Bunker Hill with the Patriots and his father was a hero in the War of 1812. I read in the newspaper Mrs. Perkins tacked to the wall at school how Mr. Breed Hyde had been called to lead the new regiment to war. How are you, young man? The colonel asked. Just fine, colonel, I replied, gazing down at my toes. I guess you'll be marching south to punish those rebels any day now. Well, I judge it won't be too long, the colonel said, clasping my hand. I hope we have time to train the men. They are pitifully short on discipline. At any rate, you will have the uniforms ready next week, won't you, Mr. Johnston? If we have to sew all night, Pa promised, and the price is reasonable, Colonel Hyde asked. Generous, Pa replied. I wish I could make a gift of them, but... Oh, nonsense, the Colonel said, laughing. What would the world come to if an honest Yankee tailor could not make a profit? Is that not why we are fighting? Well, I thought we were fighting to free the slaves, I said, wrinkling my forehead. Mom gave me a hush sign, and Pa scowled. James grabbed my hand and led me to the table. No, the boy's right, Colonel Hyde added. We fight to preserve the Union and to guarantee all Americans the freedom of our forefathers died to win. It is important for every soldier to understand his purpose and his duty. We are certain to achieve victory because our cause is just. Our men will see it clearly. It is our great advantage over those rebels. The next week, the soldiers enjoyed a considerably greater amount of freedom than any of us Johnstons did. Colonel Hyde was just one of the officers to visit Pa's shop, and we had nearly 20 uniforms to cut and sew. Pa traveled to Concord to get boxes of brass buttons with an angry-looking eagle on the front. A freighter brought us three bolts of fine wool cloth, and I helped James dye the individual pieces in a vat of putrid stain that turned the garments a bold shade of gray. The color they chose brought the regiment some problems later. <laughs> gray is what the Confederates wore. But at the same time, the thirders, as folks in St. Jay called them, looked neat and warlike in their gray trousers and tunics. They camped just outside town on the grounds of the Caledonia County Agriculture Society, which someone had renamed Camp Baxter in honor of some general or other. Every day, I delivered a uniform or two to the officers or to a soldier with the means to pay for better clothes. Often I'd stay and visit with Cal Stebbins and the three Stevens brothers from Brighton, all soldiering in the same company. Other times I would wander off and watch whatever batch was marching up and down, drilling. You the tailor's boy? A slight soldier boy of about 15 asked me one afternoon. Willie Johnston, I said, offering him my hand. Julian Scott, he replied as he took my hand and gave it a squeeze. Company E. Fur. E. Fiffer. Oh, Pfeiffer. Company E. Pfeiffer. Do you know what a Pfeiffer is? A Pfeiffer is a person who uh, blows a 
like a, a flute or a piccolo, a, a, called a fife. Okay, the fife was stuck in his trouser pockets. He had a sketch pad and two charcoals in his free hand. Mind if I have a look? I asked, nodding to his drawings. Go ahead, he said shyly, passing me the sketch pad. I'm not any too accomplished just yet, but I'm improving. They're good, I argued as I examined the drawings. It's a fine likeness of the camp. I even recognize a few of the faces. It's hard to find time between drill and fife practice. Some of the real soldiers run into town now and then, but the lieutenant keeps me busy copying out his reports. Nobody can read anything he scribbles. Life's not a lot better for a tailor, son, I told him. School's finished for the summer, but Pa just adds new chores to the old ones. I see you out here bringing uniforms, Julian said, taking a quick glance behind him. You help your pa much with the sewing? Oh, ma does most of that, I explained. I sew on buttons, that's pretty easy. Lately, I've been putting some of the cuffs on too. Ever make a pair of trousers fit? He asked. I grinned as he opened up his tunic and showed me his waist. His trousers must have been half again as wide as needed. Julian was only two or three inches over five feet tall, and I guess he weighed about 90 pounds. Vermonters, as a rule, run tall, he explained. I don't think they expected they'd need to outfit a half-grown fifer. I can sew it up, I told him, but you really ought to come to the house and let Ma do it. That way, you won't have so much uniform sticking out from behind. I make too much of a target this way, don't I? He said, laughing. Oh, I figure the Rebs will be running. They won't have time to shoot anybody, I declared. Oh, don't go counting on that, Julian warned. I know the papers say it was be a short war, but I listened to the officers talking. They know these Southern generals. I'd say we'll have a fight of it. You'll likely be a soldier yet before it's all over. Now the Southern generals were indeed very well trained. It, they were some of the top West Point graduates. So they had been uh, trained at West Point for the um, American army. But when the South broke away, they joined the Southern forces because they were from Southern states. I don't turn 11 until July, I grumbled. Oh, then maybe you'll miss it after all. Me, I might have waited, but there's nothing I haven't sketched in the mountains. Sure, I said, nodding. Not much happens hereabouts. We even have a stream called the Sleepers River. I don't plan to sleep through the war, Julian boasted. No, I want to be right in the middle of it. Then you can't wear those pants, I insisted. Tell your lieutenant, you've got to go into town. We'll get Ma to fix them for you. Julian picked up a pass and we walked back into St. Jay together. Ma had three uniforms to finish and she wasn't all that eager to take on more work, especially when I whispered that Julian wasn't long on money. When she took a look at him though, she melted like butter on a hot roll. Men, she muttered, sending boys into battle. It's a crime. Come over here and let me have a look. Well, there's no arguing. Let me mark those pants and cut them down for you. Oh, thank you, ma'am, Julian said. If you could just stitch them some, I'd be grateful. I only have a half a dollar. Nonsense, she scolded. I wouldn't send Willie out in such an outfit, and he'll tell you himself he's not earned too many consideration lately, loafing as he does. Ma stood the little fifer up next to a long mirror, marked his trousers with chalk, which is where she was going to sew. Then he skinned out of his pants and she started altering them. Leave them big enough to allow for some growing, Julian urged. Growing, Ma asked, gazing at one of his skinny legs. I don't believe they feed you soldiers enough to allow for growing. Willie, run to the kitchen and find some cookies. This child gets any thinner, his pants will slide right off them, altered or not. Julian started to argue, but I motioned him to hush. In half a minute, I was back with lemonade and cookies. The way he ate, you would have suspected Ma was right about the army and its feeding habits. 
I'm no small eater myself, but I never saw anyone gobble so many cookies in such a short time. Julian was gnawing a loaf of bread when Ma finished the trousers. He slipped them on, grinned, and thanked us both. It seems little enough, Ma replied, dabbing her eyes with a cloth. My James is your age. I hope he doesn't have to join the army anytime soon. Maybe over before long, Julian told her. Thanks again, Mrs. Johnston. You stop by and visit Company E next time you come out to Camp Baxter, Willie. I'll do that, I promised. Julian left then, and I headed for the cutting table. We each had our jobs to do, and I knew Ma was waiting to make sure mine got done. Colonel Hyde could look after Julian. Well, uh, we have some questions answered. Uh, the technique I just used in this chapter was called a think aloud, and that is what good readers do when they read, is they ask questions inside their heads, or they make comments like, oh yeah, I remember now that, uh, a cutting, what a cutting table is. A cutting table is for cutting cloth to make uh, clothes. Or, oh yeah, the Southern generals were trained at West Point. So when you do that, you're becoming more engaged in the story because uh, reading a book is not one way. It's a two-way thing. It's a communication. The author communicates to you and you in turn react. And as you react, you're remembering details. Okay, that's all from Grandma, a retired reading teacher. Bye-bye.